Well, thank you very much, Mike. With the introduction like that, we could close in prayer and go home, huh? You've heard all about all of us and all of our strengths and weaknesses. A few years ago, I was at a leadership seminar down at First Alliance Church by uh, Bill Hybels, and uh, he made this statement. He said, you know, if you have something that's worth doing, you should be able to do it simple enough to put on a napkin. He said, you should be able to sit in a restaurant and take a napkin and with a little pen or a pencil, you should be able to trace out uh, very quickly and explain to somebody something that is important to you. I brought my napkin with me this morning, okay, just so you could see it. And uh, this is kind of a visual reminder to me as I preach that uh, the three dimensions that he's already mentioned are really important if we are going to grow as people, if we are going to thrive as we have just heard. You know, I think that it's uh, God's plan that all of us continue to grow, that we don't reach a plateau in our life where life kind of gets boring again and we just kind of put our, our spiritual lives in cruise control and carry on with life as usual. God wants us to be integrally, integrally, is there a word like that, involved with him. He wants us to also make sure that we're reaching out in an integral way to people who are around us. And today we're going to continue our series and uh, talk about the pursuit of life to the full. And as Mike has already introduced, we want to start with the up part of that triangle. To do that this morning, we also want to look at two different tests. Actually, we're going to look at three tests. What do I mean by tests? Well, you'll see in just a minute. I don't know about you, but I'm one who doesn't really and never has really liked taking tests. Is there anyone here that likes taking tests? Well, there is a few. I know there are. Those, uh, those kind of people come to me for counsel all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But tests are important because it checks a level as to where we are in our development, to put it kind of simply, right? But sometimes we clam up because we go, wow, what if I don't meet the mark? Or what if I'm just not quite to where I should be? Or what if my professor kind of thinks that I really haven't been in class, even though I'm trying to take his exam and have kind of failed? But in the scriptures, we find times when different people are put to a test. And this morning we want to look at just two of those. One of them I'm going to affectionately call the Jesus test. And that is found in Matthew chapter 22, and verses 34 to 40. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to that passage, Matthew 22, 34 to 40. And then a little later on in the time that we share in our teaching time this morning, uh, uh, we're going to be looking at the story where Jesus himself gives a test to his uh, probably closest disciple, Peter. And it's a story that's well known where Jesus kind of runs him through a test and three times asks him whether he is in love with him, whether he loves him as his master. And again, we'll look at that uh, this morning. We're going to just read those two stories because they're relatively short. And then we're going to move as we uh, do our teaching time this morning. We're going to look at the upward dimension that is taking our hearts and taking our lives and falling in love with Jesus in a passionate way. Let's look at the Jesus test first, Matthew 22, 34 to 40. This is what it says. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And then just uh, flip over, if you again have your Bible or your <laughs> cell phone or whatever you're reading from this morning, flip over to John chapter 21, and we're just looking at four verses there. When Jesus had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you 
love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where, you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts this morning. Will you bow with me in prayer just briefly as we begin this morning? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege we have of going into the gold mine of your word, of reading your truth that you have given to us by your inspired word so that we would know how to walk, so that we would know how to relate to you and others in the world around us. Lord, would these be words that come from your heart this morning to myself first of all and then to all of my family here before me. Thank you for this hour and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As a pastor and as a counselor now, as I move more into the counseling area in the last part of my career, uh, I have the opportunity of working with usually young couples, not always young, sometimes in their later life as well, but usually young couples who have recently fallen in love. I love working with couples that have fallen in love because they kind of, for a period of their life, check out of ordinary, everyday, mundane living and kind of get hit with this shell shock of love, whatever that is, and uh, they're kind of on zombie street for a while until they all of a sudden realize that they need to come back down to the real world that they live in. I have made a few observations as a counselor. I do a lot of uh, pre, um, uh, pre-marriage counseling where we will talk with uh, couples that are getting ready for marriage. And often when they come to my office, I will notice that uh, there's a few things that are kind of common denominators. They are usually, I just wrote a few of them down here. They are usually to some degree a little unrealistic and perhaps a little out of control. Blind may be a better word. In fact, I had a counselor say to me the other day, marriage is a wonderful institution. And then he said, institution of the blind. Because sometimes as we're kind of caught up with this person that we've fallen madly in love with, we're not maybe as realistic uh, as we should be. Nothing wrong with it, it's just the way it is. They may be temporarily paralyzed by this thing called love. They may be somewhat short-sighted as they think of this person who has dropped into their life and uh, they're excited about the fact of marrying this person. Often they have trouble defining what they're going through, especially what it is to really be in love. I have a requirement as a pastor, and Jason has the same requirement. We agreed on this when I first came on staff, that we never marry anyone until they have at least six hours of pre-marriage counseling. Why do we do that? Well, we work in the business of marriage from every section, kind of. Uh, We work in preparing people for marriage. We also do the marriages, and then often if things don't go really well in the marriage, uh, then we might have them back for counseling to kind of do a checkup or even some mid-course corrections. When we get together and talk about pre-marriage and the, what's going to go into making a good marriage, we talk about such things as communication or conflict resolution, spiritual beliefs, life goals and plans, finances, in-laws and outlaws, so to speak, and uh, handling stress as a marriage unfolds. I love to see that because what I always do whenever we have a a workshop or when I'm starting off a counseling session, I will ask this question. I will say to them simply, my dear friends, how do you know that you're in love? Often, so some of you have already got a preview if you're going to get me to do the pre-marriage counseling for your marriage, you can work on that. But I often get some pretty interesting responses. These are some of the ones over the years that I've received. 
quite often they're caught off guard and they'll say, oh, I don't know, I just know that I am. Others will say, well, he or she is nice. And I kind of say, nice is just a little too vague when we're talking about love, but that's an answer. Others will say, well, we just love to hang out with this other person and so I guess we're in love. Or they may say he's the most perfect person or she's the most perfect person I've ever met. Some have said things kind of more practical like, well, she's just a great cook and I want to marry her for that reason. <laughs> or I've heard some of the girls say, he's got such a great sense of humor. And I kind of chuckle to myself saying, you're probably going to need that throughout your marriage. <laughs> It's great when I'm working with other people's uh, couples, but it uh, kind of ups the ante when it comes to marrying off my own daughters. I have four daughters, uh, three of them are married, and the fourth one is getting married at Christmas time. Our daughter Julie, who uh, has uh, been working overseas for the last six years, uh, she's in the horse business and is passionate about three things. She's passionate about equestrian riding and teaching riding. She's uh, passionate about serving the Lord Jesus Christ as an international worker behind doors that are closed in countries that are not generally open to ordinary missionaries or international workers. And she's also passionate uh, just about um, being serving the Lord and uh, doing what he wants her to do. A little, year, a little over a year and a half ago, Julie came home, and uh, she kind of was burned out. She had been working hard in the Arab Gulf. She'd also been working for uh, a year in the Czech Republic, as well as in Malaysia for a year, all in the horse business. And when she came home, um, we realized that it was just a good idea for her to stay home and kind of get her bearings and get rebuilt. But we didn't realize that there was also another agenda that was kind of going on behind the scenes. She had uh, fallen in love with a guy that uh, we have met since that time and uh, liked very, very much. His name is John and uh, he's a sailor in the Canadian Navy and he is stationed in Victoria, BC and uh, he works on the HMCS uh, Winnipeg ship and uh, he is a, what they call a control technician. I texted him yesterday and asked him what his title was and I tell you, don't ever ask a sailor anything about his ship because you're gonna be there a while. And he sent back a title and I said, oh no, no, I've gotta, I've gotta get something that I can read first of all and that I can understand secondly. At any rate, uh, he, uh, has the, he has uh, given her a beautiful ring and on uh, December 20th, down at the Calgary Zoo, I could go a lot of places with that one. Down at the Calgary Zoo, we're going to see our fourth daughter get married. We're excited about it, they're excited about it, and they're kind of love-struck and a bit dumb these days, but uh, that's okay. And, you know, I'm not speaking out of school because as I speak right now, John is listening to me online, either on his ship or at, uh, on shore. I don't know where he is today, but Julie tells me he was going to check up on me because I'm going to be saying some things about him. But all of my son-in-laws know that if they are going to get at my daughters, they too have to pass a test. And it's answered by that slide you saw there just a minute ago that says something like, so you want to marry my daughter? Well, you got to go through me to get to them. That's just the way I work in my house. And so I have a series of seven different questions that I have given all of my son-in-laws who have been married up till now. Uh, they all affectionately refer to it as the test. And uh, when John came into the picture, one of the first things that Dan uh, Reed, my son-in-law, said to uh, him uh, in our living room was, have you taken the test yet? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, you better talk to Larry about it because each of these guys sweated bullets when I gave them the test. Because I told them, until you can satisfactorily let me know that you're ready to face these seven areas which make up a good marriage, uh, you better think it over. Incredibly, all three of them passed that test. One of them down on the bench out in front of McKay's ice cream, the other two in restaurants. I've never seen those guys so scared, sweating, literally. But the other day, um, Julie and John came to me and they said, we want to take the test, but because John is on sea, out at sea all the time, could he do it online? Well, I had to check it out with the other son-in-laws. They weren't happy with me. They said, no, we had to do it face to face, so bring John in here and let's keep the playing ground level here, okay? <laughs> but after a great deal of negotiation, we did it online. 
The very first question is much the same as I ask all pre-marriage people. It is this, and this is the one. In fact, what I did this morning, if you're someone with a kid that's getting married or you're getting married, I've left 15 copies of my seven questions on the back kiosk. The first 15 that get there, you can have them. You can find out what goes into those things. I bet you there'll be a rush for that door. <laughs> but this is the first question. How do you know that you're in love, not just an emotional or puppy love experience? Why would a dad be asking a question like that? Well, I poured a little bit of effort and life and money and all of those things into raising my daughters, and I just kind of want to make sure that this isn't a fleeting thing. So I want to see them squirm a bit as they answer that question. The second part of that question is this. What are the character qualities that you like most about my daughter? And on the other side, the ones that you like least. Now that's an interesting one to watch. This is what John wrote back in his response. I'm reading it word for word, okay? He said in a very love-struck kind of way, there are more than a few things that point out to me that I am in love with your daughter. Whew, I'm already swept away. The very nature of a long-distance relationship would not allow puppy love to last very long for me, that's for sure. The difficulty of getting to know Julie and of our building our communication, trust, and respect, as well as the challenges of us bringing our lives together, would overwhelm simple adoration and puppy love very quickly. Over the last 33 years, I have come to learn a lot about who I am, about things of my, of, of my own feelings and thoughts, as well as my feelings for Julie. I know that these deep feelings are more than a simple crush or even lust. What I like most about Julie is her warm and caring nature, her strength and her independence, her fiery spirit, and her sense of just being alive. Wow, that's a true romantic speaking, don't you think? As for what I like dislike, and now he starts to hedge just a bit. I have to admit that I have always been a person who just takes people as they are and kind of sees them as a whole beautiful person, flaws and all. And that guy should be a politician when he's done. <laughs> Working to, be, to bring lifelong love and romance is action and commitment that I want to communicate to Julie. Oh, by the way, this, the third part of that question was, uh, and this is what he's writing about, was I say, what do you plan to do to stay in love? Because I often have people in counseling say to me, well, I fell out of love. And I go, well, you better get back in if you want this thing to last. So you better have preventative maintenance rather than try to come back to it later. So he says, my plan to make sure we stay in love is by making a lifelong effort. One of the biggest things that I've learned as a Christian is that love is not just a passive feeling that comes to you, but something that has an action component. Working to bring lifelong love and romance is action, commitment to communicate to Julie in her love languages and to stand by her and never give up on us. By very nature, love will mature and grow and change over time, and we should not fight it, but rather embrace it. How do you think he did? Pretty good? Yeah? I thought he did just real fine. Because I think what, what he has done is he has said, I realize that to make a good marriage, it's going to be a hard thing. I realize that we're going to have to work at it. But you know, as we start talking about our relationship with Jesus, he wants us to continually fall in love with him. I'm not being irreverent when I say that. But Scripture is full of the fact that this triangle, this triangle that is carefully put out in that little napkin that I have, is kind of, ha has kind of an order that he wants us to follow. The up is the first part of our relationship. For Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus wants our devotion and our loyalty to be to him first of all. He wants us to make sure that we know that we are, first of all, in love with him and that we are living in a relationship with him that is centered around being totally in love with him in various aspects of our life. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He responds with a threefold answer. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind. You see, if we as as people are going to flourish with others around us, God has made it very clear that his pattern in Scripture is that he wants us to seek him first. Often when we talk about the attributes or the character of God, we say that God is a jealous God. And that doesn't mean that he wishes he had what we had. It means rather he actually covets our relationship with him. He wants us to draw close to him and passionately follow him with our whole heart. Let's just break down those three phrases real quickly as we look at this this morning. First of all, he says, love me with your whole heart. In reading a commentary by Eugene Patterson, uh, Peterson, the one who wrote the message, he says that the word there in the original language kind of has a sense of, I want you to love me passionately. It's not hard when a couple falls in love for them to passionately love each other because there's just that glue of love that's pulling them together, kind of like two magnets. But God says, I want you to love me with your heart. And the metaphor there is the, the picture of a human heart, which without a heart, you can't live. I found that very, very quickly. I've had some heart trouble here recently. And after all of those tests and looking at some of those uh, uh, tests coming back and actually looking at my heart pumping on a TV monitor one time, I realized that, wow, that thing's been working a long time. And so far, so good. But without some corrections, I'm going to have big problems. Why? Because we need a heart to function. God says simply, my friends, if you are going to have that upward focus, if you are going to put me first, you need to love me passionately with your whole heart. When I was in high school, I had a mentor in my life, and he gave me a card. He calls it the three A's. On there were three A's, and beside each of the A's were something that corresponded with each of them. It simply said this, Anything, anytime, anywhere, and then on the bottom of the card it said, Lord, I am willing to follow you in obedience. Now, I signed that card many years ago, and one of the reasons why I'm still in the Lord's work today was because that was a commitment that I made to follow Jesus passionately with my whole heart, not my physical heart, but my spiritual heart. The second thing he says is, I want you to follow me with your whole soul. A soul is what gives us personality. It's our emotions, it's our relations, our relationships. And Jesus says, I want you to be a person who has a relationship, a free flow between myself and you and you between me. It's like having a best friend. You like to spend time with them, don't you? You like to talk to them. You like to find out what's going on in their life. And that's the picture that God has here. He says, when you come to me, I want to make sure that you are looking up and that I am your number one pursuit, that you are hot in pursuit of me to have me as your closest friend. How do we do that? That's kind of spiritual fog talk. Let's break it down just a bit. Well, if we're going to have a relationship or if we're going to be relationally oriented in in talking to God, we need to do several things. First of all, we need to do just that. We need to talk to him, don't we? Sometimes in my spiritual life when uh, I look back after a day and I realize, wow, I've made some pretty big decisions today and I didn't even bring Jesus into the conversation. I had some big challenges and I go about solving them and making things happen without consulting my very best friend. But he says to me, Larry, I I, want to be included in that stuff. I want to be included in all of the details of your life because I want you and me to be a very close, close close-knit relationship. Secondly, we need to spend time talking to him. It's not just enough to know about him. It's not just enough to read his word, although that's critically important. But he also says, I want you to talk to me, and I want you to sit in quietness at times and listen to me talk back to you so that we can have that relationship that is close and warm and intimate. I think thirdly, at times we just need to make an effort to enjoy him. What do I mean by that? Well, God wants us to be his child. 
And the incredible mystery in all of this is that the God who created this amazing universe that we live in covets a close relationship with you and with me. And so he says, sometimes I just want you to enjoy me. And each of us may do that in different ways. I'm one who loves nature. Sometimes when the sand hits the fan or I run into a wall and I just feel like life is caving in on me, I like to hop in my car and drive out to Kananaskis and walk up those incredible valleys. And I talk out loud to God. If anyone saw me, they'd think maybe I'd lost it. But that's okay. I want to just enjoy God. I want to enjoy being in His presence and letting Him speak to me. Finally, we see that God wants us to love him, love him with our mind or intellectually. You see, our upward focus on God also relates to our intellect, intellect or how we think. It's not just enough to love God passionately or with our souls. He also wants us to use our minds to approach him and embrace him. I love that uh, passage that we know well in Romans 12, too, where it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. In counseling circles, even in secular counseling circles today, there's a lot of talk about helping people who are stuck they're stuck with some problem to learn how to think differently. And I kind of chuckle every time I read one of these secular theorists because I go, you stole that from the Bible. Because God has said all along that if we're going to be passionately in love with him, that our minds need to be changed so that we think like him in everything that we do. Yes, he wants us to be changed intellectually. But then, those Sadducees and Pharisees finally ask him, well, that's great. And Jesus knows what he's thinking, and he jumps in and he says this. But there's a second commandment that is closely tied into this, and that is this. If you love me, then a resulting outflow, a resulting action will be that you will also want to be part of the family of God and the community of God. You will want to reach out to those in your church family. You will also want to reach out to those in the community who are still outside the family of God. Yes, the first component in living life to the full is pursuing God, looking up to him and saying, God, I love you more than anything else in the world. I love you with my heart, with my soul, and with my mind. But then Jesus jumps in and says to us, well, that's great, but you haven't finished the course. Because if you do that, then you need to move on to the other two parts of that triangle, and that is to pursue others, to pursue others in community to pursue those in the in category and then those in the out category. I love that story that we read and with this we close. Peter gets the third test that we're gonna talk about. You remember that Jesus had just risen from the grave. The disciples were totally devastated. They're actually very depressed. And eight of them, Peter being the ringleader, says one day, well, we know Jesus has risen from the dead because we've already seen him twice, but I don't know about you guys, but I'm going back to fishing. <laughs> That's where we all came from. That's what we did best. Let's give it another shot. They go out into the water, they throw their nets out, and all of a sudden they have another deja vu experience. Because you can remember one of the times when they did that before, what happened? <laughs> no fish. And Jesus comes along and says, hey, why don't you guys, um, you professional fishermen, why don't you throw that net on the other side? He'd throw the net on the side and we see these pictures of nets that are breaking because there's so many fish. And Jesus comes to them now and says, you didn't really get the lesson the first time, did you guys? Because they're out in the, in the water and they're fishing all night, same response. It says they caught nary a fish in some of those old translations. Jesus comes along and yells from the shore, any fish, boys? And they don't even realize it's him at first. You'd think they would have learned by now. Jesus said, well, why don't you throw the net on the other side? They threw it over, and it says they caught 156 fish. It even says that in the text. It numbers them. 
Peter all of a sudden realizes this is Jesus again. Why does he show up at the most inconvenient times? <laughs> he puts his toga around him. He hops into the water and swims to Jesus. This time he didn't even walk. And as he approaches Jesus, Jesus asks him this question three times. And I think it burned into his subconscious and into his heart. He says simply, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> love you? What a rhetorical question, Jesus. You know that I love you. And Jesus calmly looks at him. I didn't see it, but I gather he smiled when he said, well, then get into the sheep farming business. Second time he says, but Peter, I just got to ask this one more time just to make sure that, that I heard you clearly. Uh, do you really love me? Peter's getting exasperated by now. He's getting a little hot under the collar. He says, well, of course you know I love you. And then Jesus softens it a bit. He says, feed my lambs. A little more tender, huh? Then he says the third time, Peter, Peter, let's clear it up once for all. Do you love me? Peter says, well, of course I love you. And by now I sense he's probably broken. He realizes finally where Jesus is going. Yes, Jesus, I love you. Well, Peter, if you love me, you need to get prepared to do something that is passionately important to me, and that is to live in community with other people and to work with sheep that are as important to me as you are, sheep that are broken, sheep that really don't know where they're going in their lives, sheep that have made a mess of their lives, sheep that have made big mistakes in their lives. But I want you to be the instrument of coming close to them in community and being my shepherd through you. Let me ask you this question as we close. Do you know what it is to feed God's sheep? Take it personally. Ask God this morning as you go from here, if things have kind of waned in your passion for him, that he would rekindle that fire and that you could say this morning as you go from here, I'm in the process of falling in love with Jesus. I'm in the process of serving him with my heart, my soul, and my mind. And then take it personally, as we even think of how we are talking about discipleship in these weeks, of how we are going to be one of those people involved in the sheep business. You see, it's up, then in, and then out. That's how it works in God's economy. Pray with me. Loving Heavenly Father, it's fun falling in love. But I'm finding, as one of your children, that it takes longer and more effort and more discipline and more passion to stay in love with you to follow your commands to the minutest detail, to spend time with you, to love as you, a jealous God, wants. Oh, God, may we this morning learn what it is to love you with our heart, the very center of our being, to love you with our soul, that is, to love you relationally, and then, Lord, to love you with our whole life, to love you with our mind, to love you intellectually. Oh God, as we think about being part of your economy, as we think of being part of your great plan of reaching lost and broken people, may we first of all remember that our upward focus has to be in place, and then the others as a result will follow shortly thereby. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us this morning. We deeply love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.